Too often we are busy living a life that was never intended to be lived because we forget the mission of why we are alive. <laughs> and that's to get to know God, to be in a relationship with him, to grow in our understanding of who he is and live in response there too. And so it's important that we in this moment understand that you are choosing what is best. I'm reminded of Mary and Martha, right? Sitting at the feet of Jesus, just listening. That's where we need to be. And I am not Jesus, but Lord willing, I can speak to you the words of the Lord from his word by the Holy Spirit's help. And so to that end, I want to pray for myself, but also for you. Um, because as we learn in James, we don't want to just be hearers of the word only, but doers of the word, right? We want to not just be informed this morning. We want the spirit to transform us. And so that's a spiritual thing. It's not... Uh, Get your listening ears on. Did you get enough coffee this morning, enough sleep? That's the Holy Spirit, help me. Because <laughs> there's a battle. The, the, the devil does not want us to learn, to grow, to be impactful in our world today. And Asher Jablonski just gave a, a sermon on Friday that he was in a competition for on the armor of God. And we need to gird ourselves up with these things because we are at war. And so to that end, we need the Holy Spirit to be with us, with me, with you, at home. Um, so please join me as we pray desperately for God to be here with us. Father God, we thank you for a new day. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And I know lives are unique and in different places. And so for some of us, it's easier to be rejoicing and glad. But for others of us, it's really near impossible to rejoice. It's really hard in the midst of what people are going through to be glad. And so I pray that we'd remember that you are still God, that you created the days, that you are the giver of every breath that we take. And so to that end, we rejoice. The fact that you are working in the world and that you will get rid of in this world all evil and injustice and sin eventually, eternally, we will be perfected in your presence. And to that we can be glad because the tomb is empty, because the price is paid, because Christ is enough for me. Lord, I pray this morning that whatever burdens our hearts and our minds, that we would lay it at your throne and just be ready to receive. Be ready to be filled. We are the clay, you are the potter, so shape us, use us. Lord, use me. Allow the meditations of my heart and the things that I say be pleasing to you. Lord, may it be your spirit who speaks. Um, there's a lot that we need to understand, and your word is sufficient. It is perfect. It is God-breathed. And you've given us instructions to guide us on how to live. So I pray that we would, this morning, be strengthened in our awareness that you are a merciful judge. Remind us this morning that you are a God who sees the things in this world that are unseen. <laughs> You're a God who holds accountable the things in this world that seem to go unpunished. So God, I ask this morning that you would teach us who you are and encourage us to live lives in response to your presence. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, if you'd open your Bibles, we are in Genesis chapter 18, um, stepping back into finishing up a series on the life of Abraham. The series is entitled Chosen, and the, um, the idea is that God chose Abraham. He chose this family. Um, let me mention this as a point of uh, announcement as you're turning your Bibles to Genesis 18. On May 29th, we're going to have a baptismal Sunday. Um, I think it's important that we announce it, because who knows who the Spirit will move in your hearts to want to get baptized. Um, but I also want to let you know that I'm going to... Interview is the word that comes to mind, but it sounds wrong. <laughs> I'm going to have a meeting with you to make sure you know why you're getting baptized. To know 
for what purpose biblically we have to be baptized. Because I think we can sometimes follow the leader and, well, they're getting baptized, I will too. And or some people will have a false security of what's their future with God because they got dipped in water. And so I just want to make sure we're in clear standing with all those that I baptize on the 29th. So I'm asking if you want to get baptized by May 15th, let me know so that we have time then to meet and to talk. Because I don't want anybody to do something for the wrong reason, nor do I want people to, for the sake of misunderstanding of God's plan, pursue a solution to salvation in an area that is not meant to be. Um, the blood of Christ is the, is the path, right? Nobody comes to Father but by me, Jesus said, and so baptism is not a salvation element. But I want to make sure we have that conversation. So if you want to get baptized, uh, you're welcome to, to do so. Um, the baptismal is up here underneath the cross. We'll have that service on the 29th. But please reach out to the office so that we can talk by the 15th. So to have a couple weeks there to make sure people are prepared and ready. The benefit of the 29th is that that's a potluck Sunday. And if nothing is... Um, Possibly in, in people's lives, nothing is like a celebration more than their baptismal Sunday, you know? And we'll just join them in that celebration and we'll have a meal together. But it's also Memorial Day weekend. And so some families might be able to join us that weekend, traveling on their holiday to see the baptisms of their family. And so that's why we choose May 29th, um, so we can have the potluck, but also so people can travel in and join us for that too. So if you're getting baptized, please invite any and all you want to be here. Um, we hope that they can join you in this celebration. Um, but it'll be an exciting day. So um, final point of uh, information. Um, some of you that were here on Wednesday might be concerned for my wife, Joanna, because um, she bumped her head getting something out of the uh, closet, and she's on a lot of blood thinners, and so we were told to see her doctor. Well, this happened at 7.30 at night. And the doctor's office is closed, so we went to the ER, and um, we ran CAT scans and blood work just to make sure, because when you have head trauma and blood thinners, things could be problematic, right? And so all blood tests and all uh, CAT scans came back clean. They came back uh, positive, uh, uh, good for us. So uh, Joanna's absence today is not for her own, actually. Um, our daughter Libby is homesick, and so Joanna's home with them. I think they might even be watching online. If they are, Joanna, uh, give a comment online or something, because Ed's the only one that often comments. Um, okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> But, um, yeah, thank you for your prayers. We uh, need them to continue. Um, but right now our daughter is, uh, is homesick, and so you can pray for her. Um, but we are in a journey with this blood thinning uh, medication and stuff. Um, the clots are probably still in her. They, over time, will, you know, dissolve and things. But we are, we are in a good place. Joanna is doing well. Um, but thank you for your concerns and for your prayers in that way. Um, last point of announcement, and then I'll be able to have my mind cleared to preach. Um, if you like to travel and you like warmer weather, that's a, one positive to why you should stay after church today. If you want to pursue the Lord and doing ministry in an area outside your normal context, that's another good reason to join our meeting today. And if the Holy Spirit is calling you to join Hillside through a missions trip opportunity, then after church today, there will be an informational meeting, not you come, you're going. Learn about the trip um, in this room over here after church today, okay? So um, there will be people that will attend that meeting, and that God will say, no, you're not going, and you shouldn't go if God closes your door. <laughs> but you should go if God's calling you to go and not avoid that call. And so if it's even interest to you, what's going to be that trip about? It has a variety of different tasks to be done. But when we go on missions trips with a ministry, we often are ministered to more than we ever planned to do to the people we go to see. So I pray that you'll be open to the Lord saying, hey, just go. Get the information. Have something to pray about. Because it's hard to say no to something you don't know what it is. So I pray that that room gets full after church uh, because it helps to know the information. The, the dates that I'll give you so you can kind of not eliminate this already is at the end of January of 2023. So you don't have your calendar set that far in advance. I'm pretty sure you're clear. Um, so don't rule out the possibility of getting that information. Okay? All right. Done with announcements. Let's hear what the Lord has to say this morning. Well, we are in this series, again, called Chosen. Um, many of you watched The Chosen, uh, New Testament, Life of Jesus series. Uh, it's 
it's pretty good. I would I recommend that it would be studied alongside the Bible, right? It's not to replace the Bible, but it does help to see that these are real people. Jesus was a real person. He had a mother. He had friends. Um, but they were chosen second. <laughs> Abraham was really the first that was chosen, right? He was the one that God chose to be the people of Israel, out of which grew Jesus and the disciples. But this is really, the, in the Bible, the first choosing, and so don't get them confused. I'm not referencing uh, the, the TV show, but, but Abraham and his family was chosen for a purpose. We'll even see that in the text this morning. But today I want to aim not at who Abraham was, but at who Abraham's God is. And we're going to learn today that Abraham's God, our God, Jehovah, Adonai, Yahweh, that he is the merciful judge. And in a story about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, you would think this is not the passage you would use for merciful judge, but we'll see in the text what God teaches us about his mercy and his judgment. Many people um, have experienced uh, a car accident with two people. Um, maybe you've been in them or you've observed them. This even happened to people within our own church, and a lot of insurance companies would be like, who is at fault, right? Like, no, you did it. No, you, you're the one that didn't stop. No, I had the right of way, and there's this argument, right, about whose fault it is at a traffic stop, at a traffic accident. Well, this might also be uh, true for those of you that have children, because this is often what a home looks like. Well, there's this fighting, no, she touched me, no, he did it, no, and there's this... Who is right, you know, because there's this argument of these people who have certain perspectives, but they don't have a mediator, a person necessarily to solve these problems. That's where I'm getting, right? So there's these problems in traffic. There's these problems at home. Maybe you even have problems at work between coworkers, between colleagues, that things just aren't going well. And I got the report in on time. Well, they didn't give me the stuff I needed. And there can be these battles in our society. I pray they never get this far. If, if anybody's ever like having their hand on you, the, the, the battles at work are hopefully verbal, but there is a, a tension all around us, isn't there? In traffic, at home, and at work. And you, you might even argue with people about, I was in line first at Aldi and somebody cuts in front of you and, hey, that's my cart. No, the, I'm going to get the last cereal. Don't even go shopping on Black Friday, right? I mean, there's some problems of conflict in our world. And almost all of these situations pursue justice, pursue somebody to come in and mediate and find out what's true, who's right. A boss that's really good with his coworkers will hear both sides of the story and they will help to come to a conclusion, right? A parent is going to hear what happened and maybe even be aware of things the kids don't even know, you know? The people in the traffic accident, hopefully there's some evidence of, of helping to show what actually happened to uh, you know, a camera or something in the area that helps this happen. But we, we want justice, don't we, in our world? I mean, we, we desire for, if I'm right and you're wronged, I hope that I will be shown as right and you will be hurt and judged because you were wrong. And, and there are things in our world that we see that we sometimes are in the midst of the conflict or that we're asked to do the judgment of, and it's really complicated, <laughs> What we're going to learn today is that God is the judge of the entire world. If it's hard for me to be a judge of my two children, think about how big the task is, how difficult God's job is for us to comprehend, for him to judge the world. Every conflict, every situation, God sits on the throne. But if we know who God is, we would want nobody else to be there. If we know who the God is good, if we know that God is for us, if we know that we are covered by the blood of Christ, then I would want nobody else judging the whole world, would you? But often we forget, we, we understand maybe God's job, but we forget God's resume. And today we're going to see that he's not only judge, but he judges with mercy. Praise be the name of the Lord. 
So this merciful judge, I want us today to ask, what should we know about God? The merciful judge, what, what should we understand about God in this way? And in the text, we will see, uh, I think, four today ideas that will help us. First is that God hears the cries of injustice. God is aware of the brokenness of our world. Look at what it says at the beginning of this story Verse 16, the men set out from there, and they looked down toward Sodom, and Abraham went with them and set them on their way. And the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? I'm going to skip 18 for a moment, skip 19 as well. I'm going to come back to that. 20 says, the Lord said, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, their sin is very grave, I will go down to see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me. And if not, I will know. God, God hears the cries against these towns. Doesn't he also hear later in the text we read the, the cries of his people as they are slaves in Egypt? God hears the cries of injustice. God hears the tears of the brokenhearted. But God doesn't just take the word of the people only. He sends um, agents, right? He sends messengers, angels, to go and go see if what I hear is true. Go experience it for yourself. So our God not only goes by what he's told, but he has an awareness, right? He has an observation. He has an experiential knowledge to this injustice. We, we know it through Jesus, what he experienced on the cross. He, he knows what injustice feels like. He, he's been there. He's been the righteous person treated unrightly, the criminal death for the perfect man. God knows what this feels like. God is aware of the outcry. So where does Abraham fall into this? This is where I want to step back into verse 18. In verse 18 of this text, we see that he says about Abraham, um, Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation. All the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. So there is, remember, the promise that he made over him, the, the purpose that he has. Through you, all the nations will be blessed. So there's a longevity of Abraham's lineage, of his family, of their ministry. They are still a people group today. The Israeli people are still alive today, and God has a purpose for them. Many times our cultures, if you do any kind of history of the world, they're not very long, right? I mean, the Romans came, they went, the, the Greeks came, went in terms of their, net, their power. There's still people groups and things, but like the dynasties kind of come and go, right? But this family, God has a plan for them forever. They're going to be a great and mighty nation, which is not just good for them, not good for their power. Notice, with their might, with their greatness, they are going to bless the nations. God has a plan for them. Well, why does he need to tell Abraham? Notice at verse 19. I've chosen him, Abraham, that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. Church, I think God wanted Abraham to learn about justice, to learn about righteousness. How is he, in verse 19, going to command his children to keep the way of the Lord by doing these things if he doesn't even know what they are? Now, God could have assumed that Abraham knows because of what he's already done, but he's about to give him a great lesson. And what happens with Sodom and Gomorrah on righteousness and on justice that he then can teach his children? Abraham, sit down. Class is in session. (laughs) So God hears the outcries of his people. God is aware, but he wants to make Abraham aware of his awareness. He wants to make sure Abraham knows that God is not devoid of hearing the outcries of injustice. In days to come, when the people of Israel are under slavery in, in Egypt, they need to remember, remember, God hears the outcries of injustice. When the people of Israel are taken by the Babylonians and the Assyrians, God, they need to remember that in this time when we don't have our land, that God hears our outcries of the injustice, and, and he's going to come and he's going to 
bring justice. And so this is something that Abraham learns and passes on, which becomes a foundation for knowing who God is. So what do we have to learn about this even today? God does hear the cries of injustice. Um, when we were parents, we had uh, Libby in 2013 and Eli in 2015. And it's amazing. I mean, you know, you sw- go nine years later and like, you can watch your child on your, on your smartwatch today probably, you know? Like, it has gone a long way. When I was a child, when, when you were parents or when you were children, you probably had different means to hear the cries of your children, to, when you're babysitting, to be aware of whether that child is taken care of or is in trouble. But there are things that we are benefited by, by having ears close to the ground, right? That we have proximity to the problem helps us to be more aware. If a parent or a babysitter or an aunt or uncle is watching a child and they are in the upstairs nursery and you go to the basement to do laundry without some sort of monitor. Now, a nurse comforted us in saying a crying baby never died. It's true. The problem is when they stop crying, right? Because if a baby's crying, they're taking a breath to cry. They're, they're doing okay, but when a baby stops crying, that's when we have concerns. And, and so we have to kind of be aware. But, but I don't think a distance for a short period of time is bad because I come up from the laundry and they're crying and I go and comfort them. But what if a parent fell asleep or um, got inebriated and was just out? And the baby is just like crying and they're just not heard because there's a distance. Church, God is a close God. God is not far off. He is not busy doing something else. He's not distracted from being your loving Father. And as good as the technology is today, whether I can have a video camera in the face of my child, it is not the same as what God offers to us that we would be the temple of God. Wow. God is close. God knows. Many people who doubt God feel like he's far off. We read in the Bible again, where can I go that I flee his presence? (laughs) To the heavens, you are there. Down to Sheol, the place of the dead, you are there. There's nowhere we can go that God is not. There's nowhere that your children can go that God is not. There's nowhere that your neighbors can go that God is not. There is a proximity to God to all things. So the cries are heard. They are noticed. God cares for you. He cares for me. That's not the only thing we learn um, about God. Yes, he hears the outcries of injustice. But God also is merciful with our ignorance. That was a harsh word. I asked Joanne if there were any better ones. But to be ignorant of something is to not know, right? In fact, a famous saying that I'm actually growing to despise is ignorance is bliss. What does that mean? It means to not know something is actually a good thing. It's actually a gift to be unaware. Uh, I'm growing to know that that's not actually true. But ignorance is a place that we are in. As humans, we are limited to knowing all things. We would say that children are ignorant to certain things because they have not grown up yet to grow in knowing how to spell, how to read, how to drive. There, there's an ignorance, right? And so I, I'm not calling us ignorant as a, a knock on you as a person. I'm saying we lack knowledge. Would you agree with that? I mean, I don't care if you're the smartest person in the world. There are things you don't know. We are ignorant, but God is merciful with our ignorance. If you look at the passage here, um, 22 all the way to 33, get, get a reset when you can, not a problem. If you have Bibles, we don't have to have screens. You have a cell phone that can open up to a Bible probably too. In Genesis chapter 18, verses 22 to 33, here's what it reads. So the men turned from there and went toward Sodom, but Abraham still stood before the Lord. Then Abraham drew near and said, Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? 
Let's pause there, because that's his basic of understanding, right? The way God works, it's an all or nothing kind of thing. Either they're kept or they're swept. That's what Abraham brings to the Lord. First of all, I compliment Abraham for talking to God in this way. I don't, I don't criticize him. He's being honest. He's being open. And in our openness to God of our confusions, God can correct our confusions. So we don't need to hide from God what we really feel. He already knows them anyways, right? It's why I love Thomas, the doubter, because he's the only one bold enough to say what everybody else was too scared to say. But Abraham here is like, God, like, will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? And then he goes into this math problem. I used to have a math uh, job teaching, and so it's incredible. Math is important. It's even in the Bible, right? Um, He talks about, well, what about 50 people? If if there's 50 people that are righteous, that love you, would you spare the city for them? Now, I didn't find exactly the estimated population of these towns, but it is large. These are big cities. And God says, if I find 50 then I would, I would spare it, right? He says that in uh, verse 26. If I find 50 righteous, I will spare it. But look at Abraham's ignorance in the gap of his statement and God's response. In 24, he says, Suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Will you then sweep away the place and not spare it for the 50 righteous who are in it? Look at this um, Offensive comment towards God. Look at verse 25. Far be it from you to do such a thing, to put the righteous to death with the wicked, so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Far be that from you, shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? Abraham feels that justice is wickedness gets punished, but righteousness gets blessed. And it's an all or nothing kind of thing. The city's either all destroyed or all saved. Come on, God. My nephew's there. Lot lives there. I care about him. So for his sake, lower the bar a bit. And so he goes from 50. God says, yeah, for 50, I would spare it. Now, it's important. I don't think Abraham changes God's mind. If any of you have ever, like, at garage sales or something, a person has, like, their actual cost of a product. You know, like, I, I want to get $2 for this thing, but I'm going to mark it as 10 Like, hey, would you take 8 uh, I'd rather have 9 Well, you know, and you start haggling, and you really want to just get 2 Church, God knew how many people were in Sodom and Gomorrah that were righteous. In fact, if we fast forward to the end of this sermon, God destroys these two towns— Maybe one righteous lot. Maybe three if you count his daughters. His wife turns around, so not her. So at most three. Like, God's like, uh, ten's too many. Well, let's go with uh, five. I'll, I'll give you that even, because he knows the hearts of all the people. But I love Abraham saying, like, God, your mercy would just be so demonstrated if for so few people you'd save all the city. But the ignorance of Abraham is that he does not see how God could do both mercy and justice. It has to be one or the other. Either spare them mercy or judge them justice, but they can't both exist in the understanding of God in Abraham's heart. Do you see what I'm saying? He's ignorant. He doesn't know. God hasn't modeled this before. Now, where has God modeled justice? Well, in Genesis, we see in the flood, God wiping out the entire world and starting over because of the hearts of men were continually wicked, right? Always thinking of things. And we can talk about that mercy and justice there because he does spare a family. But, but there is an element where there is a God can do some destructive things. Abraham's heard the story. He, I'm sure that people are aware of the God who started over with the floods, right? And so there is a fear of God in that way, but Abraham doesn't really understand. So we see God allowing Abraham to kind of play his game his way. Yes, if there's even less, I would spare it. Yes, 
less I would spare it, yes, less I would spare it. And, and Abraham is aware of who God is. He's like, forgive me, I, I have, I'm, I'm but a worm, I'm but dust, I'm going to talk to you, uh, but I have something I need to say, right? And so there is a reference in how Abraham says this, but Abraham is pleading on behalf of Lot. In fact, your Bibles probably have the title that Abraham intercedes for Sodom, intercessory prayer, coming in on behalf of somebody. An application of today's sermon I want you to take away is that we should have intercessory prayers, that we should pray on behalf of people. God, I I can't pray that you save them, but I pray that you protect them from further danger, from further harm. Jesus said it from the cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, did that mean everybody in his presence was in eternity? No. But don't let this event be a hurdle to their salvation. Allow what they're going through right now not to be used by the devil for evil. So I pray that you would protect them from the harm of what the situations are around them. We can't pray people into heaven, but we can pray a protection around them while they're going through earthly hell. Mercy, holding back what we deserve. Abraham should be commended for that. Job does it, doesn't he, for his children? He offers sacrifices for the sins of his kids. He doesn't even know what they're doing, but I, I'm sure they're doing something that I need to offer sacrifices on behalf of them. Were they forgiven because of what he did? No. But I think he did allow for their hearts not to harden as quickly because he called out on their behalf. You know, we can't pray people into heaven, but we can't pray that God doesn't let it go so quickly to destruction. Lord, protect them. Don't shut the door. Intercede. But this is a time that God is merciful. He lets Abraham speak. He does not judge him. He doesn't send lightning bolts down on him because he talked to him in this way. He's understanding. He's patient. He's kind. So again, we'll go over all the math and just say it went from 50 down to 10, right? Um, the one that's math in my mind is, a guy, he's like, what about five less? He's like, for 45? So God knows how to do math. 50 minus 5 is 45. Um, all right. God is merciful with our ignorance. Um, a lot of us celebrate warming weather. And those of you that do probably aren't mowing a lot of yards. Because... They come in together, right? Um, I don't know about you, but I, I actually like to mow. I actually like the smell of the fresh cut lawn, and it just feels like an accomplishment. Um, but with all this rain, if you forgot to mow yesterday, it might be a jungle by the time you get another chance. You know, like you, you got to sneak it in when you get to chance. But I had the honor on Thursday after uh, my son got home from school um, of mowing. And Joanna's like, hey, you should go ahead and help your dad. And he was going to pick up sticks and pine cones. And I'm, I'm like, you know what? Not for my sake, but I think he's ready. And so I uh, desire my yard to look like a baseball field. If you know what I'm talking about, like lines are straight. There's no uncut grass. If I can get the pattern, I actually alternate the way I cut. So I go this way this time. Next time I go this way so you can get the checkerboard pattern, you know. And I desire my lawn to look like the professionals. But I had the opportunity on Thursday to let my son help. And uh, he mowed. Um, (laughs) He's only six, turning seven. But he, with the self-propelled mower, helps him to be able to do it when he's younger, you know. But he did it. And the hardest part, right, is... Is the turning and the pushing down and moving the mower. And I don't care that the lines aren't straight. I mean, I'm, just, I'm so glad that he did it. I'm, there's probably grass that's not cut. But I, I'm okay with that. He, he doesn't know yet. He's learning. Do you know that God allows for us to make mistakes and to do things the way he wouldn't necessarily want because he's just proud of you? As you're, as you're growing up in Christ, to come alongside and just, let me try. And yeah, great. It probably took us twice as long to get the yard mowed. And like I said, it looks squiggly and, and all these things. And in my heart, I'm like, that's not how I would mow it. But I didn't come in and tell him to do it differently. I just let him do it. Because I, I was okay with it. He, he doesn't know any better. Don't we offer mercy for people that don't know? 
People that try their best and didn't know any better, we just kind of have a little level of forgiveness. Church, God knows what you don't know. God is aware of how little of a knowledge of you knowing God that you have. God is aware of how small your gap of understanding is to the world, to the justice, to the way of salvation for all those who would pursue him. God, God knows that you're just unaware. And he's merciful. And so declare your confusion. God will understand. But God wants to teach us. He wants to grow us. If I talk to you this time next year and my son still mows like that, then I've been a bad father. Because I have not taught him how to mow correctly or instructed him in ways that can make it better, right? Because there are things that we can do that do sharpen our skills. God doesn't want a messy Christian, but he will grow you through the mess of being a Christian. Maturity, remember it talks about in the Bible that we at one time drank spiritual milk. But we grow out of that, right? We, we get more mature in the faith and we grow up in Christ. And so wherever you are in the stages, God would say, it's okay. Just keep trying. You're doing so good. I'm so proud of you. Kids help with gardening. They help with dishes. They help in all these things. And does a, does a project actually get done the way you want it? Maybe not. Uh, there might not even be any water in that can. But we're just so happy the kid wants to help, right? That's how God feels about you. Just do what you can. Thank you for wanting to help. <laughs> Thank you for asking. Well, thirdly, we see God is merciful with his judgment. And for this, I'm going to actually jump into uh, chapter 19 and just look at some of these verses here. I'm not going to talk about it so much. I'm still at the Bible preach. But look at verses 12 through 29 of chapter 19. This is a sad story. There is destruction that comes. But look at where God's mercy is in the midst of this. Genesis 19, verse 12. The men said to Lot, Have you anyone else here? Sons-in-law, sons, daughters, or anyone you have in the city, bring them out of the place. For we are about to destroy this place because the outcry against his people has become great before the Lord. And the Lord has sent us to destroy it. Let me pause real quick and say, based on the contract that Abraham and God just made in chapter 18, that means that God did not find 10 in the whole city. In order for God to destroy this, and our God is not a liar, he said, if I find 10, I will not destroy it. Destruction is coming. Hearts of people have been tested. There are not 10 righteous in all of the city. So he sends these men to destroy it. Verse 14, Slot went out and said to his sons-in-law, who were to marry his daughters, Up! Get out of this place, for the Lord is about to destroy the city. But he seemed to his sons-in-law to be jesting. <laughs> not... No, we're okay. We, we don't need to go anywhere. Are his sons-in-law part of that ten? It doesn't seem to be. They're not fearing the Lord. Fearing the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom, right? And so righteousness requires a knowledge of who the one is that says he's about to destroy your city. Remember when Jonah came to Nineveh and said, Repent, repent, destruction is near. And what did they do? The city repented at the message of destruction. What did God do? He relented the destruction for a time. We don't see that with Sodom. People are just like unaffected. In verse 15, as morning dawned, the angels urged Lot, saying, Up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be swept away by the punishment of the city. Verse 16, but he lingered. <laughs> like even Lot is not in a hurry. So are there any righteous in Sodom? So what happens in verse 16? So the men seized him and his wife and his two daughters by the hand, and the Lord being here, it is merciful to him. And they brought him out and set him outside the, the city. And as they brought them out, one said, Escape for your life. Do not look back or stop anywhere in the valley. Escape to the hills, lest you be swept away. And Lot said to him, Oh, no, my lords. Behold, your servant has found favor in your sight. And you have shown me great kindness in saving my life. So God, through his, his angels, comes and he takes Lot where he doesn't want to necessarily go. But Lot is appreciative. Lot knows that it was for the best. 
But he says, but I cannot escape to the hills, lest a disaster to overtake me and I die. Behold, this city is near enough to flee to and is a little one. Let me escape there. Is it not a little one? <laughs> and my life will be saved. And he said to him, Behold, I grant you this favor also, that I will not overthrow the city of which you have spoken. Escape there quickly, for I can do nothing till you arrive there. Therefore the name of the city was called Zoar. Now church, the destruction comes to Sodom and to Gomorrah. But God shows mercy, unlike Abraham's thought, all or nothing, not ten, oh no, lots done. No, God can remove and destroy. God can have mercy and justice because our God is both merciful and just. <laughs> when you read this story correctly, does Lot even deserve to be removed? I would say no. He was warned. He since uh, accept the warning to warn his son-in-laws, but not warning enough to for himself leave. He is pulled out. He is grabbed by the hand and said, "Come with me," and made to leave the city. Church, it's important that we understand this story too in the destruction that is promised for sin. For the way to sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Right. Many of us, if we're honest, do not deserve the mercy of God. But he, through his mercy and his love, grabs us by the hand and says, follow me, and leads us through his spirit to an awareness of love that we've never known before. We did not deserve to be saved. But God saves. He saved here. He saves today. <clears throat> If you look a little bit further, it says, The sun had risen on the earth when Lot came to Zor. Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah sulfur and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the valley and all the inhabitants of the cities. And what grew on the ground? But Lot's wife behind him looked back and she became a pillar of salt. And Abraham went early in the morning to the place where he had stood before the Lord. And he looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the valley. And he looked, and behold, the smoke of the land went up like the smoke of a furnace. Church, judgment had come. In fact, Sodom and Gomorrah is a reference to how bad things will be for other people. Like this is as bad as it gets. Judgment has come. But look at verse 29. So it was that when God destroyed the cities of the valley, God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the, of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot had lived. The only reason that Lot was spared is because he was family of Abraham. Because Abraham had come to his defense in the lowering of the number. Now, we can't know exactly, but imagine this story where Abraham doesn't challenge God on his justice, doesn't come to the defense of his nephew. Would God have spared Lot? Would it have seemed as if Abraham wanted Lot to be saved? I think Abraham models for God, just like Moses does over Israel when God says, let's wipe them all out, Moses, and we'll start again with you. And he's like, no, no, this is a stiff-necked people. But... You fulfill your promises. And God wanted to see Moses in that situation come at the defense of his people. And I think Abraham here is applauded by the Lord for defending his nephew. And his nephew is rewarded because of Abraham's love. So he saves Abraham from this destruction even when they choose the land, right? Remember, Sodom and Gomorrah was the more... Um, desirable place and Lot chose it because it looked nice and God's like, hey, it's okay, I'm going to bless you. This is the land we're going to be in. But God spared Lot in the midst of his choices to be spared as well. All right, in Exodus 34, there's an important passage that we need to understand that connects to this passage even today. Look at Exodus 34, verses 6 through 7. This is God talking to Moses on the mountain and he talks about who he is. This is something that if I were you, I would underline, I would memorize. 
the Lord describes himself to us. In verse 5, it says, The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. So God's declaring who he is, his name. Here's what he says, verse 6. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. And most people stop memorizing right there because that's the last part of God I want to remember. There is no hell. God saves everyone is happening when this verse gets cut off before the word but. Our God is merciful. He is gracious. He does forgive. Those are all true. But God, who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to third and fourth generations. Church, we don't like to memorize that part of the verse because it just seems harsh. No, church, it's just. God is perfect. He calls us to be holy for he is holy. He warns us that the actions of wickedness will have punishment. And if there's no punishment for wickedness, then what a fool we are to give our lives to Jesus Christ if we'll just make it there anyways. No, the blood of Jesus saves us from something. So those who don't call on Jesus, they should go to what they're not being saved from, correct? I mean, there is a salvation from judgment, salvation from justice. And I'm not saying we need to go back to uh, the fire and brimstones, hell kind of sermons, but there is power in knowing what we've been saved from. And power in declaring to people that aren't saved the danger of what's coming. That is a statement we need to hold true because God will not forget the guilty he won't clear the guilty. If you're guilty, then there is judgment. That's what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, um, finally, this idea teaches just a real quick statement. is that God judges the world in perfect justice. I, I went over this earlier when Abraham spoke of this, but look what he says here of God, okay? At the very end of this verse, verse 25 of chapter 18, Abraham says, Far be that from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? And Abraham is correct. Because God is the judge of all the earth. Capital J, notice. And he is just. But Abraham had to, in this story, learn what justice looked like. He had to learn that justice and mercy could be together. Because Abraham is right in saying, far be it from you to do such a thing, to put the righteous to death with the wicked. That's true. That would not be just. So the righteous fair as the wicked. That's true. That would not be just. But Jesus came to make the righteous not have the same fate as the wicked. <laughs> this is the truth of the judge that we have. The justice of God is that the just and the unjust are not treated the same. It's not an equal Situation That would be unjust. But because of the blood of Jesus, the righteous blessed, the unrighteous cursed, the ones that follow God as their Lord and Savior are with him, and the ones that are not depart from him and never knew you, is because God doesn't treat everybody the same. If he did, we'd say he's a mean God to send everybody to hell. But he's not a just God if everybody makes it to heaven. That teaching today is dangerous and a lie. Jesus warns about it even in the pathway to righteousness being narrow and the pathway to destruction being wide. Many will refuse God as their Savior. I don't like the idea of it. In fact, the more I think of it, the more I despise the, the theology, the study of it. But church, hell is a real place. I would sign up for hell if it was like a thousand-year punishment. If the people that got it were there for a million years, maybe. But forever? 
darkness forever, loneliness forever. This is what's coming. So anyone who says, I refuse Jesus as my Lord, okay then, I, I, try to tell, I try to tell you, I try to save you, like, the message is, call out to God because danger is coming. We as a church, we as Christians who have been saved, need to, with love, through relationships, make sure they know who we are so they don't understand the message that we preach, that it, it needs to be a, hey, reach out to Jesus, why? Because he wants to save you. Not because he wants to be your friend. I do have a friend in Jesus, <laughs> but I've been saved from destruction because he is merciful, but he's also just. In John 3.16, we have a very famous verse. I'll close with this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. But if we read beyond that, look at what Jesus teaches. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe here it is, is condemned already. Condemnation is already there. God doesn't bring condemnation. It's the natural result of our sin. The wages of sin is death. <laughs> but whoever does not believe in him is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. Church, people that refuse God refuse God because they don't want God to be Lord of them. They'd prefer the life they live than the life that's offered. They'd prefer to stay in the life they are living than pursue a life that honors the Lord. And look what it says in the next verse here. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come into the light lest his work should be exposed. True. I mean, things that I do that I am most shameful of, I don't let other people know about. Things that we do that don't honor God, we love to do in darkness, in hiding, in secret. Very few people, unless they get such a, a bold and harsh heart, don't project their sins to the world. It's kind of a, nobody's looking, and we do our thing, you know, and that's what sin looks like. So light of God is dangerous because it exposes these things that we try to keep hidden. Whoever does what is true comes to light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. And church, the benefit of a Christian is not that we sin less, but that we respond to sin quicker. <laughs> Think about that. I still sin as a believer, but when I sin, I know what to do with it in a way that I never knew before. Because it's in the light. It's healed. It is made whole. Our God is a just God, perfect in his justice. Finally, I just want you to think of this way. Um, in testing, there's always an answer key, right? I said this at the beginning of the sermon, but it's worth saying again. The fact that God is your teacher, the fact that God is grading your test is good. He knows every thought you've ever had. He knows every action you've ever made. He knows every regret you all have experienced and that I have experienced in our lives. But he loves you. <laughs> desiring that none would perish. While we were yet sinners, he died for us. Church, God knows, but he is good. I want him to grade my life. I want him to evaluate whether I am covered by the blood of Christ or whether I'm not, because he knows those things. People that think that God has Thanos power, that he, in a moment, just gets rid of whoever he wants to, that he's a, a mean God, you know, they don't understand who God really is. Because our God does know, but in that knowledge continues to love. What an awesome God. Let's close in prayer. Father God, you are the God Almighty. You are on your throne. And we are aware of your power. 
But the beauty of who you are, God, is that you are bigger than we could ever comprehend. Your ways are higher. Your thoughts are higher. Who can understand them? But you revealed yourself through your word. You've revealed yourself through history. And as you taught Abraham that you can both be merciful and justice, Lord, teach our hearts the same. Help us not to just accept God as the lover of the world, forgiver of all sins, and there's never a punishment. Lord, help us to see that without you, we are hopeless. Apart from me, Jesus said, you can do nothing. (laughs) Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. And so, Lord, we need to hear this morning that there are many people, maybe ourselves included, who are headed to destruction. But by the grace go I, but by the grace go we, the grace of the gift of Jesus Christ, the blood of Christ, who saves us from death and gives us life, who takes us from the enemies of God to children of God, from a life apart from him to a life with God forever as his children, as heirs to the throne. God, help us to see what we've been given But help us also to pursue your love and mercy and justice for the rest of the world. There are those that come to our minds and our hearts that we appreciate that you've stepped in and you've shown mercy. Lord, there are others in our hearts and our mind that we are afraid that you will eventually show them justice and destruction because they are not calling out to you. And I say to those people, break their hearts before it's too late. Bow the knee, rock bottom their lives so they look up to you. Lord, what gain is a person to gain the whole world but lose their soul? But what a joy we have if we give you the world for the salvation of our souls. God, this morning we say thank you. Continue to grow us in our awareness of you. And thank you for your patience as we grow in our faith and our knowledge of you. Go before us even today, we pray. In Jesus' mighty name, all God's people said, amen.